on this episode of the Roundtable Podcast. It's a little bit everywhere, but I think there's some great nuggets here, Danny. Yeah, lots of great takeaways on confrontation, finances, and our personal development shit going on. Shout out Small Arms Danny for running the show. <laughs> Facts, Trey. Yeah, Danny did a great job of running the show. I think uh, you know he's turned into a quite a great podcaster, and I can't wait to listen to him on the Tim Ferriss show one day. You know what? And um, I'm not going to talk anymore because it's Danny's time to run the show. Let's go to the show. <laughs> Roundtable podcast. I'm your boy Corey G. Small Arms Danny at Trey Speed and the graphic gangster himself, Cole Susak. Uh, Roundtable is going to be uh, produced by Daniel Small Arms today, but it's brought to you by Sam Adams in the new pre extreme at yeah. maxeffortmuscle.com. Shout, Shout out to my jug of water with the silhouette of the hot chick with a fucking surfer board. Yeah. I feel like I'm on vacation when I drink out of this. <laughs> where'd, you, you, where'd you get it from? I don't know. It just showed up in my house. I think I got it at Outer Banks, <laughs> actually, when I was on vacation. <laughs> Probably one of those th- times where I lost my water jug it's often. End up using this. Put a little pre extreme in this motherfucker. And it, <laughs> is, is that what you got in there? I was about yeah. to ask you what you're sipping you on. You just don't know, do you, Cole? Yeah. <laughs> hey, yeah, shout out to Cole. Are... He's competing tomorrow. That's right. You yeah. excited? I am pretty excited. When's the last meet you did? Uh, oh, it was the one it where you would have been in March or the whatever. The one where you used like the meatball. Where I was looking diesel. I was weighing basically the same as weight as I am now, <laughs> but I was fucking diesel. I think yeah. uh, for that meet, I drank. Like literally an entire glass of pickle juice. <laughs> you did. You're all bloated yeah, up. I was bloated red. the fuck oh, up. God. My eyes yeah. were puffy as fuck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this, I'm taking a more of a different ap- approach. Yeah. I'm not trying to really fuck up. I'm not going to try to bloat too heavy. I think yeah. I am going to get Bob Evans for dinner. Shout out Bob's. Yeah, what up? You know, you know going Shout throwback Robert. to that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> Can't go wrong but, with that. Yeah, no, I feel good. I'm just going to treat it like another training session, basically. That's what uh, Tyler G was saying. He was like, well, I'm going to squat and deadlift tomorrow anyway. So. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's like the <laughs> end goal, but. The um, I saw Todd when he was walking out. You know, he's, man, I think uh, I think I'm gonna feel pretty good tomorrow. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> he's like, so I should eat some more food. I'm like, dude, I just drank like a cup of chicken noodle soup and then eat pizza. That's the superset right there. He's like, yeah. Oh yeah, I might try that. I'm thinking. We've known each other like 15 years. Yeah, Todd, you know? I, I, Todd always asks me some questions like that. Like you think like, he should like, already know. I'm like, what do you yeah. mean, Todd? <laughs> uh, but I think he's just you know making sure he's doing whatever's right. It's so good. Yeah. What, what is what is Todd at like numbers wise? Like range? Like what is he? He's gonna do he? he's gonna do single ply and he's gonna try squat 600. Yeah, he weighs 195. That's titties. And he's gonna bench raw, which I assume will bench somewhere between 340, 350, 330, 350, 350 and then probably deadlift like a low fives. All right. I mean, it's 54 or 55. So yeah. awesome. Yeah. Don's going to squat maybe like mid fives. He's yeah. going to be like. Is he going multiply? Multiply yeah. 181. Don Hoff. Don Hoff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Fucking Don with the ringer T out there. Oh, yeah. yeah let's go. <laughs> yeah. He's, he's hype. He weighed in at 176. I mean, he's going to own all the records. Yeah. So, yeah, so. I'm, I'm looking forward. The whole crew, plus, um, we got Diego's first time meet, Bobby's first time meet. Um, so a couple of the younger dudes, um, Jake Holland, just second time after, um, doing the lunge record, uh, obviously Tyler G might break 1600, not might, I think he will, which would be our first 1600 plus total in the crew, which would be sick. Um, what's he opening out on squad? Do you know? Like six? No, I think, I think his plan is a squat 620. So he's probably going to open like, like mid fives. I think 550 ish. 550. Yeah. Um, did I miss anybody? Who else competing? Um, I think you, I think I got everybody, right? Yeah. You got Bobby yeah. Diego, uh, Preston. Preston's oh yeah. Complete. Preston, yeah, Preston, the, you know, had a couple good squats last time, but fuck some stuff up cause he was a first timer. So I think he'll do good and shout out to Preston on the squat day. He has a hard time getting past the warm up sometimes, yeah. but he's in there fucking busting his ass. He's going to other racks, but I think he'll be able to, uh, I would think past 400. So that would be a good, I think good, good day for him. So, so I think yeah. it'll be good. The the tr- the crossover from <laughs> basically being a golf pro to a power lifter is a little tricky. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But but I think that'll be good. Um, yeah. So I'm looking forward to the crew. Me and Trey will be down there mm-hmm. hanging out, supporting our boy. I'm gonna wrap some fucking knees. Yeah. I'm, I'm ready, ready to. to I'm ready to get this over with. I'm ready to have a good time tomorrow. Then fucking go to Shred Town. Yeah. Like I'm ready to go to Shred. You ready to get them shadows on them arm pictures that yeah, Trey yeah. takes at the end? That's right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like it. I, I'm actually looking forward to it. I'm anticipating that I'm going to be in Hollywood soon. Mm-hmm. So I need to get prepared for that, Cole. So yeah. if you're going to Shred Town, I will already be there. I'm on my way there. 
Usually, I would just laugh at you when you say that, but I'm it's dead actually serious. potentially like yeah. a thing. Yeah, like, no, yeah, yeah. I told you I was about to get hot again. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Danny, run the show. <laughs> Jesus Christ. All right. Well, I mean, this kind of feeds into it a little bit. Um, oh, and our conversation. How does it feed yeah, into yeah, it, yeah, Danny? Please explain. Well, <laughs> explain. well, no, just like powerlifting and oh, like okay. signing up okay. and doing shit like that, right? So, okay. and just the conversation. Fuck. How'd, how'd that go? <laughs> I just ran my cup into my mouth. No, right? <laughs> Did you see that? <laughs> Dude, that was, okay. that was a softball. Yeah, let's go. Yeah, All clip right. that one. <laughs> um, anyway, Jeez. we hit, we had a, a conversation yesterday about one of our quote-unquote vendors mm-hmm. and how to kind of manage that. So I figured it would be helpful to talk about how do each one of us handle uncomfortable situations and or concentrate confrontation in just in general because uh, at least for me personally i'm not a confrontational person <laughs> you know i try to avoid it like the plague if if i can but obviously you can't avoid all things so i would say most people are probably that way yeah, yeah. for sure so right. i don't know very many people i've ran into that like get excited about that yeah. there's people that get more comfortable at it mm-hmm. i don't think anybody like likes it yeah for sure i don't think anyway <laughs> no so really just mm-hmm. my question to you guys is how do you guys manage it? What do you think the right or wrong way to go about it is? Um, and what's your advice for the, all the homies? I think there? we start with Trey. We always come. I always, I always go that way. I'm going. Let's start with Trey. What do you think, Trey? Um. So I'm thinking like my mind went like straight to like the advice. So like for confrontation, like I think a lot of people are like afraid of confrontation because like they're afraid that they're gonna come off like a certain way and like hurt people's feelings and stuff like that. So like I think when it comes to confrontation, like being able to like remain pot- like positive and like actually have like cri- like cr- like constructive criticism like in that process i think is super important like how you how you're actually like wording how you're talking to mm-hmm. the person if that makes sense you know yeah, I mean? yeah because like you gotta remember like how powerful words are and stuff like that so like how you word it to the person i think that like plays a huge huge role mm-hmm. definitely in like how the just like in how the situation is gonna like end up and stuff like that so that comes to mind Definitely is, yeah, that, and then... So it's definitely not, like, a one-size-fits-all, the same thing, same Mm -hmm. approach for everybody. I've always taken this, like, uh, me and you have had a couple conversations like that, right? We've worked together for three years or whatever now. But when I would deal with Trey, and it was, I would always say about how much I cared about him first to let him know that we got to get through this, but but let him know, like, dude, I care about you. And so we had one thing where, you know, something had to part ways. And the second conversation we had, I was like, I was like, first off, just know whatever you thought was intentional was unintentional. And then let's get to fix what we need to fix. <clears throat> mm-hmm. So I think sometimes like, especially if it's somebody that you really care about on your team, if you try to, cause it's uncomfortable and no one wants to feel a certain way, but I try to say like the way I'm really feeling so they don't so then when we get to it we can just get to it Mm -hmm. so it's not like i'm trying to act a certain way like hey man this was my bad or hey i didn't mean it this way now like how do we have a resolution then it is uncomfortable but at least it's like less weird i guess Mm -hmm. that's how for people i care about that's how i operate or at least try so yeah and it's usually not like it's just being uncomfortable for a small amount of time. Yeah. Usually, because like you kind of think it's like going to kind of blow up, or it's going to like carry on, and then your next interaction is going to be weird with that person. But but his point of the words are powerful. Mm-hmm. If you say something like that, that's vulnerable. Then at least the person knows yeah. you're not coming at them like, yeah, at their yeah, fucking and like, neck. And like the word you used to like vulnerable. Like if you make yourself like vulnerable, then like yeah. the other person's obviously going to let their guard down a lot more. Too. Yeah. Like, so then you can that. get somewhere. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess speak on that Trey. Like when you hear that coming, it makes you not as much on the defense, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I think like, that's like when you're having a confrontational like conversation, like nobody like should be like in the, like in the defense, you know what I mean? Like everyone should just, it should just be like an open like ground. Like, cause if someone, if you make someone feel defensive, and obviously, like you're done. Yeah, you're not gonna get anywhere <laughs> in the conversation. Yeah. So that's interesting too, because I immediately thought of like being on the receiving end of the confrontation. So like, what do you do when you're being confronted by somebody or something's being addressed? So, um, what do you guys do with that? Because like, at least the initial or like human reaction is to get defensive, probably, right? Uh, but it's like, how mm-hmm. can you? I think the right response is to kind of zoom out to try to see the the big picture of where they're coming from. Mine is really weird how I react to this kind of stuff 
because when I know the other person does not care about me, right? That's clear. I start laughing <laughs> because if it's really fucking ridiculous and they're hitting me, I'm like, are you, I go, are give, you give us an example. I, Without naming names. Uh, yeah, you know, I just names. think like <laughs> there's too many. That's why there's a fucking shit ton. Whenever something would come at me like that, I'd be literally like, "This is fucking." Are you kidding me? And then like, and they look at me like, "Why are you laughing at me?" And because I think it's that absurd. And then there's really nowhere to go from there because if I'm at that point where I'm truly think it's so ridiculous, and I know we're not going to be working together or homies anymore. It's laughable, and then I'm just like, all right, cool. <laughs> yeah, because there's a point where you're just not, you know, that's why I would operate. Because then the laughing's a little bit disrespectful back. Because mm -hmm. then I'm telling you I'm dismissing because you're so fucking ridiculous. Because you didn't come at me like I, the way I talked about with me and Trey or either any of you guys. I've, I've always tried to do that if it was weird. <clears throat> I understand the value. Here's what, what we're trying to get to. Like when you're hearing stuff like that, that's different. You come at me like, you just did this. You just did that. All right, man. Yeah. Yep. So my mind goes to uh, like, you know, with dealing with the creative process. Like if someone, you know, gives me no guidance and it's just like, you, you just do what you do. And they, they trust me because this is what I do for my fucking job. And I make something. And then after I deliver it, they're like, no, that we don't like any anything like this. My automatic <laughs> instinct is I immediately get fucking pissed off. Or if like I make something on my own and there's no direction, they're just expecting me from something, and then they end up like truly not liking it, and then they try to take over that creative control. It drives me nuts, and it's automatic fucking shut off function. Basically, I I at the time I have to in my mind mentally shut off and clear off everything that's going on, and then probably after my emotions settle, then I'll come back to it fresh mm -hmm. because that just drives me. Well, because you just spent time on it, it's understandable. That's yeah, and I and I do you things didn't have like any direction. on yeah, it's like and I do things on purpose and and what I think's best, mm -hmm. and then. You know, if they don't like that, then you probably should have fucking told me something to begin to begin with. Yeah. And then that comes back to should have I have asked more questions? But then that becomes to a thing of where now I'm like the creative like yeah, control yeah, monster yeah. and they, they don't feel like they're contributing or anything like mm -hmm. that. That's true. So it's a balance you gotta ride. I would say like once you understand the brand, I mean, does anybody really change more than ten percent of something that you kick back, Cole? It if, seems like if, very rarely do I have like anything major. If the other person is a creative person, yeah, that, like a, you know, they have a vision, they're con like controlling like mm -hmm. that, like they always have to be involved. I can immediately feel that. Yeah, you know? yeah. Well, yeah, and also like, I think with you, you you got such a good eye for everything that, and also with our age difference. Yeah. I'm going to be more trusting of my younger guys when it comes to stuff like that, because you know what people are looking for. Yeah. So that's interesting though, but I, I could see that, you know, it's hard. What you're trying to do is not get hurt from it, but also be like looking at the process. Like, did I do enough? So then I don't have to be back in this situation. Yeah. Like, like you said, asking enough questions. Or well, it's just like, you know, if you wanted it to be a certain way, why didn't you just tell me to begin with? Yeah. Like if you're working with me and you trust in my skills and stuff like that, mm -hmm. like would you go to like a car and they get your engine fixed and then you look at it and be like, oh no, I don't like it that way. Like you got to do it this way because that's how I would expect I need a it v to seven. be done. You know, <laughs> like I would never do that. Yeah, it's true. Does it feel like, obviously it feels like a waste of time. Does it like feel like borderline disrespectful to you or is it just depend yeah. on the situation? Yeah. But then at the end of it, like, yes, it, it, immediately it basically feels disrespectful. But then after like fucking few hours, I'm just at, I don't give a fuck anymore. You know, let's just get it over with. Yeah. Cause you got to like step back and be like, okay, yeah. yeah that's but then not what they if want. you have that conversation with the client cold next, do you just say like, Hey, next time. Yeah. Like the next time I'll make sure like, yo, you got to have your like shit together. Basically. Yeah. <laughs> like I'm not fucking basically wasting my time anymore. Well, no, because then you can just pinpoint it, knock it out, be done. Yeah. Even if like you're 80% for it, but they're a hundred percent, you know what yeah. I'm saying? And now just so everyone knows, I wouldn't say, Hey, you gotta have your fucking shit together. I will, ba <laughs> I will basically <laughs> say, sure. I will basically say, yo, like, Hey, like, you know, can you give me all the details before I start working on this? Yeah, like I'm yeah. just not trying to waste both of our time. Yeah. So like setting the expectations. That's just setting yeah, the yeah. expectations. Yeah. Yeah. That's also like being uh, like in business now long enough. You start to know, like yeah. uh, when you work with certain people that, um, you know that's coming back 
So you got to get more information because if not, you're dub- double the time. You're yeah. like, fuck this. Yeah. yeah, I vibe with that. But uh, another thing of like this confrontation in the gym, like I think that shit's ne- like needed and necessary. And I think that's the one time where you have to fucking fight back in it. Like yeah. you have to like basically stand your ground and fucking because most of the time it's just fucking dumb bullshit. When you say that, though, you know, most people that go to their gym are never going to have confrontation unless it's. You know what I mean? Yeah. You're talking about because you're in a competitive environment. Well, even like in sports uncommon. teams or anything true. like that. Like that shit happens all the time. True. Sports teams probably a lot. It needs to be happening more often. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. So that leads into the other part is like how do you get better with it? Like how can you actually apply or, you know, apply it to your particular situation? So we talked about it yesterday is like the exposure to those uncomfortable situations, not necessarily being, you know, confrontation or whatever, but just doing hard or difficult shit like squatting fucking 600 mm-hmm. or like for me it's like the goruck shit because like for me with the with the goruck stuff how i was how i've said before like i sometimes like to go to an event where i don't know anybody because then i have no choice then yeah. i then i have to do something because you're put in those leadership roles where you have to be the facilitator to accomplish something so like you're gonna have all different types of people you know girl guy different ages all this shit but you're in trying to like coordinate like different pieces of the puzzle to like carry all this shit to get it to here. And then, but you have this guy that's like not being a team player or this guy doesn't want to carry this, this shit. Mm-hmm. So like you have just managing that. So, well, with the vendor thing that obviously me and you were working on yesterday was, is that, was that situation, is that situation uncomfortable for you? Um, <clears throat> it was initially. And then it just went back to, I had all the evidence on my side, which in turn made me more, way more confident sure. in where my position was because I've been in it since the very beginning. I know exactly what is fucking going on. Mm-hmm. I know exactly who I've been dealing with and what they've been saying, and I have the stuff to back it up. So I'm like, j- it was almost to the point where you like just boil over and you d- you're just fed up. with Well, it. and I think that I just get to that part faster with the laughing part. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. know yeah. what I mean? Because if in that case, if that you know, situation came to me like on the phone, I would say, well, don't you think it should work before I pay for it? And then I would just sit there like, yeah. cause it's laughable when I say it out loud, mm-hmm. you want me to pay and it's not working. So the fuck are we doing? You know what I mean? Exactly, so like, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's literally like laughable. Cause then they have to say it in their head. Yeah. Wait, I got to say this out loud. Oh, it doesn't work yet, but we want our money. Like get the fuck out of here. <laughs> Logic. I just want it to work. Yeah. I'd gladly pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I think that I, because I've been doing it for so much longer and I've had some heavy converse, confer, confrontations in my business career, I just get there faster. Probably because I just don't have as long a fucking leash as I used to. Because I was way too nice for way too long. Like, I think you guys know that I'm weathered at this point on that, at that level. <clears> but I've, you know, I got taken advantage of a bunch when I was younger because of that. Yeah. So. I don't know. I mean, it, I also was able to build a lot of relationships because I'm a nice guy. Well, that was also what I was going to kind of ask you because, I mean, out of us four, you definitely have probably – you obviously have the most experience with it mm-hmm. in all different areas of your life. Is like how – like <clears throat> do you kind of like pick your battles? Is that kind of how it goes? Or h- how do you kind of uh, approach that, like what you deem like worthy of? Like, of a confrontation? Yeah. Um, I would say sometimes it is the leash is just – is finally up. Mm-hmm. That I, I can, de- I probably can deal with stuff longer than most, you know, because I also know like to unravel things or to cha- make major changes, you have to be really ready. So I would, you know, sometimes things just are last straws and you're just like, all right, it doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. Like, I just can't handle this no more. I'm, I'm out. I'll have the confrontation. And then usually I feel better after it. Um, when it comes to like, once again, like somebody I really don't care about. I can get there pretty quick now, especially if I know that it's like a chess game. Like I'm right in this occasion. They're not doing what they should have done and I can be super direct, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, But also like, I mean, I'm pretty hard on Kyle a lot, but it's because I care about him and I want him to get better. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it's like, so I think there's, I think there's both. Um, I challenge a lot of guys in the gym because I care about him, want him to get better. You know what I mean? So I think that, I'm one of those guys that is really nice, but can go there quick. I don't really want to, mm-hmm. but I'm going to fight for my team. You know what I mean? And for what I believe in at a, at a aggressive level if needed. And I think that I'm also, I mean, it's, 
something I've learned from both of my old business partners. Like you have to assert that in a lot of these rooms to let people know that you can't push me around. Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't, I didn't really do that a whole bunch when I was like younger, but I, as I've got more confident, like, you know, I feel like you command more respect, but it's not in like a front way. It's just like, I think once you get enough confidence behind it, people will just feel it. Like, you're just not going to fucking push me around. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm just, Dustin told that old story about how, I mean, I, you know, I confronted my old landlord when I had no business probably being that way, mm -hmm. but I finally was just fed up. So I think, but also I had my own money. So that's the thing is I was only 20, but if he kicked me out, I could go pay for somewhere else. I'd have to rely on anybody. So I think part of it was getting enough confidence in myself and then also knowing I'm okay if it falls through in theory. So whatever that situation, I always look at if I really go at this and it goes away, am I okay mm -hmm. with that? Mm -hmm. Am I okay where the pieces fall? You know, and there's also times I flew off the handle and it wasn't right too. And I'm yelling and you know, whatever karate chop and shit, karate chop and shit. But also people listen, <clears throat> I'm trying to do things at a high level people have to know that I'm that guy, I think sometimes. And if you're dealing with vendors and you're doing hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars, whatever, you should be on your shit. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? <clears throat> and we've had trouble with all of our vendors at times where they've been lackadaisical and you gotta let them know like, yo, I'm paying you millions. Why am I having this conversation right now? Mm -hmm. And then I just, I, I like to say stuff that's hard hitting and then sit and then give that like, where does that come from? <laughs> it just yeah. reminds me of Wolf of Wall Street when he's, he's like the, the first person that talks loses yeah. <laughs> or something like that. Yeah, well, with the numbers, it definitely yeah. is that. But yeah. I think like when it's a confrontation, you throw, you're throw you throwing something hard hitting at him and then stopping. And you're waiting for the reaction of what am I going to get back? And then, you know, you get all kinds of different things back. So Cheat code. Yeah, I think it's a little bit of a, a cheat bit, code. Yeah. I think just I've handled everything which ways and some of them worked out and some of them didn't but it, it, i don't like confrontation either but i'm not scared of it yeah i think it really does always come back to confidence to, at least to some degree because <laughs> like everything does yeah for sure i don't like confrontation with people i really care about that's frustrating because to trey's point you never want to come off some way that's why i i learned over the past when it didn't work out well and there was a couple things i couldn't reel back even though i didn't come off that way I, that's why i would start the upfront conversation with yo you know, I care about you. You know that I, I, this is whatever. Let's just get it handled so we can move on and, and be the same. Mm -hmm. And then that just kind of lowers everything instead of everybody coming up like this. <laughs> like, I'm a, the, like the fighting Irish Rock. guy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because I mean, I've had the same thing with Dustin too. Like, you know, something we don't agree on, whatever. And I'll just be like, you know, just reel it back for a sec and figure it out. Mm -hmm. You know, ultimately we can figure it out. Yeah. So um, where you go from there, Danny? I don't know. Did we go to our max effort pre-extreme break here? Yeah, we can. What time is it? Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's about a half hour. Yeah. Shit. All right, we'll be uh, right back. This is the Round Table Podcast brought to you by Max Effort Muscle in the new pre-extreme workout. Get you something. It's available now. Mr. Gregory. Cue the music in my hands. If you are ready for the craziest, most pre-extreme workout extreme. of your entire life. Extreme. You got to go to MaxEffortMuscle.com and get the pre-extreme It'll blow your mind. It, the pumps are so crazy. crazy. The mentality's nuts. You'll be in the gym for two hours. hours. You won't, you'll be like, what muscle group do I do? All of them. You'll be in there all day. <laughs> all, every, all day. All day. Small <laughs> Danny, what do you think about the pre-extreme? So extreme. <laughs> extreme. <laughs> Mr. Trayvon, what do you think about the extreme? Extreme. Yeah, yeah. Extreme. <laughs> It's available now on MaxForMuscle.com. That has the internet today. All right. All right. Back, back to the show. Back to the show. And we're back. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Producer Danny, where we go from here? Well, uh, I'd like to welcome you to the uh, smaller segment of the show here today. Yeah, okay. So happy Flex Friday. Um, yes. <clears throat> so absolutely. just one question here. So we're actually going to kind of rewind to what our topic was last week with Joe mm. Johnson. Okay. Shout out. Shout out. Um, so... If you were handed, this is for all of you, if you were mm -hmm. handed 5Gs or 10Gs right now, what would you do with it? Mm -hmm. mm. Cool. Yeah, well, uh, I think right now with how, like, the market's shaking up. Well, actually, there's two There's two things I, I'm 
doing currently actually is I invested into a lot of stocks that are like really good that are just beat up because of the market cycles and all this shit and inflation recession talk and shit like that. Um, <clears throat> so I put it in there and probably, you know, let it ride out for maybe, you know, a year or two, uh, you know, take those profits, put them back in dividends. And then eventually is to get in the real estate, like get, like get a house. So like, that's like my future game plan is to wait and see what this housing market around here like does, whether it comes down, comes back down. So then I can get a first property, live in that for maybe one to two years. And then by that time, my goal is to get another property and rent that first one out and start that cycle. Love it, Cole. Yeah. That's cool. Trayvon. Um, I think that if I was given five or 10 G's, I would sit on my hands with it. Um, <clears throat> Because I think sometimes the best position that someone can have is just liquid cash. Yeah. And so that I think like sitting on my hands with it and waiting for the opportunity that I think that I can't deny when it comes my way. I think yeah. that would be the move. Great advice, yeah. Trayvon. How about you, Danny? Answer your own question. So it's either that. <laughs> it's either that. Um, <clears throat> That's a, I've heard that uh, from a lot of big people that cash is a position too yeah. because of because of the, you know, just that exact point yeah. well that that deployed. was that was like super highlighted when the the whole max effort thing came up yeah like, true and I, I think there was something even before that i don't remember but like not being able to participate mm. or take advantage of the opportunity really bothered me so ever yeah, yeah. since that point i've made it a point to save for those scenarios that exact thing though is how you learn all these things mm, exactly like every business cycle whether it's market whether it's housing i learned something <clears throat> uh, every every time it happens like oh next time i see this Next time this comes up, I mean, that's... You ready? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and the book I'm reading right now, which we've talked about before, but The Psychology of Money by Morgan Housel, mm -hmm. he talks about this specifically. Um, just like, I don't know, he, he it basically all co comes back to, like, the emotional feelings you have around money, <laughs> you know? Um, and so that, that was one thing. And then going back to Joe is that, that it's just my jam, dividend investing. So it makes sense to me. I'm more of a like long-term guy. I'm just going to buy the, you know, more conservative approach and just let it ride. Yeah. So that that's what I would do. I'd probably just split it down the middle and fucking go. Yeah, 10 grand, I definitely would go with the highest um safest dividend producing stock, which right now seems to be Altria, which is MO. It's paid for fucking, I don't know, 80 years. It's 45 bucks. It's eight and a half percent um, dividend or eight point two five. It's paid out every year and raised it for literally forever. But I don't think it's a long term stock because of what the nature of it. So those dividends then would be reinvested into something else mm -hmm. that I would quote unquote believe in longer term <clears throat> or be something that like I own a decent amount of Verizon because I use Verizon all the time. To me, it seems like one of the best pays a good dividend. So it's like, I just actually <clears throat> made this exact call is I have my Altria dividends being invested into Intel because of all the Intel shit that's happening here. Mm -hmm. Intel's at 28 bucks. It pays a good dividend. I believe in it long term, especially with all the building we see going on around here. It's like, so I'm taking a good paying stock that I don't necessarily believe in long term, but flipping the free money into something I do believe in long term that still also pays. Mm -hmm. So that's probably what I would do if I just rocked the 10 grand for sure. 100%. What? This is not financial advice. Could no. your financial advisor. Actually, yeah. fucking, I go buy a watch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> go get a Rolex. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I think it's a topic we should like just talk on is because you know we're basically all involved with with a financial advisor, but I think we're all smart enough to manage our own money for sure. And I think it's important to you know, like why I have a financial advisor is because those long term investments and stuff like that. I don't want to be, cause I know I'm my own worst enemy. I don't want to be in charge with all that money. And then I'm constantly moving it around, not giving it like an opportunity to grow. Yeah. I like having Joe to basically be like a second it's defense a stop, man. to basically, if he just act like, if you just think about this, he asked me why I want to make a move. I have to have my shit together. It's not just an impulsive, like, Oh fuck, I got to take it out right now. Dude, I tried you know? to. So, you know, I'm all about, you know, I'm like all about dividends again. So I called him. I'm like on a move this you know, quite a bit of money from Amazon in all dividends. He goes, Corey, I got my, all my clients buying Amazon right now. It was at like $90 when I called him. He's like, just leave it there. And just the new money you bring in this 10 grand, we just ran into do that. Right. 
So now today or yesterday it went up to, it was like 112. This is like two weeks later. Hmm. So, I mean, I was going to take like a mini loss cause I was trying to get my new strategy, which doesn't make any sense. But if I was managing my own money, I would have did it hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. So but there's Joe's on your shoulder. There's both. <laughs> there's both because then there's times where I'm just like, no, this is what I'm doing. It's my cash. But I like that second defense because I know myself too. And I just get, I've always done better if I'm just staying in one path for a while. But to your point with the cash thing and what Trey said, when the pandemic hit, I was in a good cash position. So I was able to take advantage of it. Mm -hmm. And so I was able to buy a ton of stuff really low, sell it high, lock in good dividend percentages. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's, that's definitely, and I've been in that position and it really upset me too. When I was like, there was something going on and I couldn't take part in it. Yep. And I was like, fuck this man. Like I know, cause I know the opportunity was passing me by and it drove me up a fucking wall. Yeah. Well, why don't we like talk slightly about just like being like going to like, you know, Kiyosaki style mm -hmm. fucking employee versus an owner. Mm -hmm. Like why don't we talk about that a little bit? Because that's what we're all talking about yeah, yeah. is, you know, you can be an employee in your business where you, you work for the paycheck, you get the paycheck or you can be a fucking owner. And then you get that return on it, right? Well, and also just even in your guys' cases, being contractors within, you know, part of you guys own part of the businesses. Some of you don't, but it's like the, even our setup is completely different because, you know, Cole had a, a, another client here yesterday. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, you, and you guys have shared other clients. So it's like, you know, being able to, this is the biggest problem I, I had when I just got a paycheck. I was stuck with that only. And there was no room to make it bigger within those hours where in our setup, you can still do other more stuff, right? We have our consistent money, including myself. And then we have the ability to create more The not having the ability to create more is the hardest was the hardest thing for me to conceptualize. Mm -hmm. I, I struggled with that pretty bad. So it's like, I think that even if you have a steady job, there's gotta be something that you can kind of make happen on the side. Do you get an extra 50, 100 bucks even on something you like to do, like extra on a Saturday? Mm -hmm. Makes a yeah. difference. Like one client. I remember like having friends, they'd have like one, two clients. They make like 100 bucks extra a week. Dude, that's like their groceries. For sure. You know what I mean? So like I think that <clears throat> just, you know, sparking that in someone's head, there's a passion item they probably could do. They call it the side hustle, whatever. I'm not trying to be cliche like that, but it's true and that makes a difference. Then people start to think, What's really possible here? Because mm -hmm. when I went and spoke at the high school yesterday, one of the girls asked me, what um, what made you really want to do this? And I was like, everyone I was around hated their job. And I just didn't want to be that way for 30 years of my life. Get the fuck out of here. It's <laughs> a big yeah. chunk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's <laughs> we're going to do. We're going to be working more than we're not working. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? So we got to half like it. Mm hmm. You know, so I don't know. It's just, I think that there, these things are so elementary and back to the point of like, kind of that there's like a point of no return to me. It just felt like I couldn't even allow myself to have to get there. Like that. I was just like, I'm already there. I think I'm already there because it was worn. I was worn down by my family and I was like, I'm already at the point where I'm willing to try it because I just don't want to be this way. <laughs> I mean, like, yeah, for real. You know, does that make sense? Yeah. Like, I think their their struggle for multiple generations of disliking and seeing how they operated made me already at that point. They did it for me, basically, which is why I'm so thankful that it happened that way. Because then I was like, I'm just not willing to be like this, mm -hmm. or I'm gonna fucking go down in flames, and then I'm okay with what's left. I just have to deal with it. I, I literally am telling you guys that that was my main thought process. If this fucking blows up, I'm just going to go back to doing something I was already good at, which was coal mining. I literally, and then I never thought about it again because I wasn't scared of it. Yeah. And if you're not scared of it and you believe in yourself, it changes everything. It changes everything because mm -hmm. you're yeah. never making, you know, decisions based on, I hope it doesn't work. You're making decisions on, I know it's going to work. And if it doesn't, I'll be all right too. Yeah. still sucks, but <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a good way to manage the fear. <laughs> you know what I mean? So yeah. I know like Tim Ferriss talks about like, he calls it like fear setting. So like basically imagining the worst thing possible that could happen at the beginning. And it's 
no, almost 100% of the time, it's never as bad as you think it is. <laughs> it's like, oh, okay. Setting gotta... it up that way and then never really coming back to it, not allowing it to rent space. Mm-hmm. Oh, my gosh, what if this happens? Oh, my gosh, what if this happens? You 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 say, oh, what if this happens? Mm, can I deal with that? Yeah, it's going to suck, but okay. Boom. Then you just never really address it again. Yeah, it's huge. Yeah. But I think also, like, if you're – like let's say you're an employee and you're trying to get into the self-employed thing, you can build up to where whenever you make the jump from being a yeah. nine to five employee to being self-employed, yeah. like you said, if you build up like just a few more clients, you're already like, oh shit, now I only need two more clients, yeah. but I have all these work with these people. All I have to do is, hey, can you just refer me to yeah. like, you know, maybe two people that you think could also use this? Also the exercise of like I've done with Danny and I think we've all talked about it from time or not about like, you know, what's it really going to take? Some people don't even know. Actually, they pay their number, bills. Yeah. yeah. But like Danny literally brought a spreadsheet out yesterday and was like, look, da, 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 da. you know what I mean? Like really knowing that it's two more clients, yeah. not thinking, oh, well, I'll just get a couple more clients. No, no, I need seven more clients and this is my new life. Dude. Yeah. And then what happens if you're not only doing it for four hours on a weekend, you're actually doing it for all day long? It's like yeah. wildly different. It changes everything. Oh my gosh. Actually seeing what that number is. Or like how many people you have to get on? Because that's called a real strategy. <laughs> yeah, it's not a fucking. <laughs> yeah. fairy it's not a fairy tale. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because <clears throat> even like when I was trying to make the transition down here to this building and doing and trying to balance all this stuff and with the buyout and all, it's like you have to say like, all right, if this goes to that and that goes to this and how what you know how is this going to op- like you have to weigh all those things and then work backwards sometimes. Every time I've ever done that, usually the thing I'm working backwards from ends up happening. Because I actually have a fucking real strategy. I mean, I just don't know if people put it on paper enough because they don't know if they really believe it can happen. Yeah. But the execution is usually not that far away. Um, Levi, uh, one of the lifters that we all fo- follow from, um, I don't know if you follow him, but I've been following him. He's like in his garage. He's one of the trigger warning guys. Okay. He's uh, like a 165. <clears throat> He's an iron worker. I don't think they have heat in their garage. So I don't know. They're like it's somewhere where it's cold as shit right yeah. now. But there's a gang of dudes in there working out. He's got clients on the weekends. He literally hit me up like, yo, gee, uh, it's starting to pop off. Like, yeah. how do I scale this? What's the, you know, so I'm literally going to go through this process. And he was a kid that I saw like tagging us. I started following. I watched and I could see what he was doing. He got his mom in there. He's practicing on That's her. Sick. He's got like, you know, so-and-so's friend. Like he's doing what exactly I said. Get a crew. Grow your crew get some clients, and then all of a sudden, people are like, well, wait, this space over here is only $400 a month. Why don't you do it in this building, not that building, like not in your garage anymore? Yeah. It's literally that process has happened to this kid right now. And he's already blue collar. He already knows how to work hard. He already loves it. He competes, whatever. And so it's like, you know, so I love taking those phone calls because his, his face is on fire right now. Super cool. Yeah. Super cool. You know what I mean? So similar to Anthony. So when you hear stuff like that, it's like that is the way he's building it on the side and now it's going to he's going to have sooner than later going to have to make a decision on do I jump or not. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So it's pretty cool. Fuck yeah. <clears throat> cool. What's up, producer? <laughs> Anything else you guys want to talk about? No, that was some good I shit, like fucking no? with Danny. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I used to. I would be like, oh, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> now it's yeah. whatever. Um, anything for- so that's a good that's a good point, though, Danny. Like a lot of people on the microphone would like, yeah, be all weird about that. But if you just act like you would normally act without the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, remember when we were, you know, doing our what fifty episode trial run of the the G cat or whatever we called it, the G unit roundtable, the G unit roundtable <laughs> yeah. on the porch or whatever, yeah, yeah. and. I think it was pretty early on, but you, we each had to run a show or yeah. whatever. Yeah. yeah, I was like, that was like sweating bullets. That's hilarious. Yeah. Sweating bullets. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, what the fuck am I going to talk about? And now today you <laughs> asked to run the show. Yeah. yeah. So good. So. I, all right, here. Let's, uh, l- let's talk about, so we talk about money. Let's talk about personal development. What sure. all are, are you guys like listening to, paying attention to? I'm glad you asked that because yeah. I've been, li- I listened to Cameron Haynes' new book, Endure. Okay. And it's really good. So, I mean, dude. The four words written by David Gawkin, or the four words written by Joe Rogan, the password, whatever the thing is after is David Goggins. They both voice it over on the, on the audio book, which That's is wet. sick. Yeah. And what I love about Cameron Haynes is I don't know shit about hunting. I literally asked Schlegel. I put this on my story. Yeah. 
can I come shoot the bow with you? <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. I, I know I, that nothing. That sounds like a good Same. field trip for all. I think it would be amazing. Yeah, I don't know anything about that shit. I had a client back in the day when I first started that used to build, like, legit, like, Native American recurve bows. Really? So he was, like, super into it. Yeah. And he shot them, like, he did, like, archery contests, but he he actually made, like, I don't know if he whittled it out of fucking wood. I don't know what that he did. That's sick. But he made it. Yeah, shout out Marvin Avery. So he fucking, so I was, like, kind of around it, and my grandpa did crossbow, but that's kind of like a gun, basically. Now, Cameron is hiking up mountains, like, shooting, like, sheep and elk and, like, I mean, it's like some, yeah, some like, big game hunter type shit. High level, you've got to, like, yeah. You carry what you kill. Yeah, dude, it's <laughs> yeah. it's pretty gangster, and he still has a regular forty hour a week oh, job. Shit. He works at like the water department or some shit, or he's like a superintendent for construction. So this dude runs almost a marathon every day, and works a regular job. Plus, does all this other stuff where he's sponsored by all these companies and shit. Yeah. I was like pretty blown away, which is why Goggins and all these guys like him and Rogan, right? But it's like what I love and what I can really identify with is his bow hunting is like lifting is to me. It's all he really wants to be great at, right? And mm -hmm. thinks about studies, watches. And then because of that pursuit for 30 years, it's now crossed all these verticals to where a guy like me is thinking about going to shoot a fucking bow and arrow with Schlegel. <laughs> I mean, are you kidding me? I grew up in the middle of the country. I hated all that stuff. <laughs> like, so it's one of those things. But what he was explaining was – the meditation part of it, the, you know, the art of it. Like, and so I'm getting it all. It's because he's so into it. It made me want to fucking try it. So I was really impressed by that. I was impressed by, I could really identify just with the blue collar, like just the way he operates, um, the constant push. His son beat David Goggins' pull-up record. Oh, that's right. Yeah. yeah. That's savage. So that's kind of fucking gangster. Um, and just like, uh, the vulnerability of like dad, like, you know, he's obviously a really busy dude. He pushed himself Did he push his kids too hard. Was he around enough? Like that balance of being like, obviously obsessed about something, but you can't be great if you're not obsessed. So, but super authentic. Um, I don't know. I was really, I really liked it. There was parts in the hunting stories that I got lost a little bit just cause I'm not super into that, but overall I was getting what he was saying and, and I thought it was, uh, I definitely must listen for sure. I liked it. Very David Goggins ish. Yeah. So that's what. Yeah. yeah. Small arms. <clears throat> uh, I'm kind of double fisting. Whoa. Right um, Shout out to Sam Adams. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> um, the, the two books. So the one I just talked about was the psychology of money. It's told like in like short stories. So like it's a lot more digestible. You can like, you know, read a chapter than like not yeah. read it for like a week and you're fine. Like, I, I need to get it. Yeah, so th that one I would recommend for sure. Um, it's a different take on any – I haven't read anything about it like in any other financial book. So the way he, he makes it digestible through stories, and it's <laughs> like the that. easiest way to learn. Um, and then the other book, um, um, learned from Ryan Holiday um, from his reading list or whatever. But it kept coming up over and over again. But one of the people I really like and to learn about more is, is uh, Teddy Roosevelt. Yeah, yeah, you've always talked about yeah, I like, Teddy Roosevelt. Yeah, he's shout out Teddy. Yeah, yeah. R.I.P. Yeah, um, but if you haven't read, um, well, side note: The Rise of Theodore Roosevelt. If you haven't read okay. that book, mm -hmm. amazing. You should definitely read it. It's like his like climb to power of being president and shit. But The River of Doubt is is what I'm reading right now. But it's his um, excursion down into the fucking Amazon. So this is before like shit was like charted on maps and stuff. So like. It was like kind of like halfway there, but the River of Doubt was an uncharted river on in the fucking Amazon. And so like went. nobody d had no idea what was going on there. So he just like he lost his third um, election. So he he ran twice. Obviously was president, and then the third time he lost. So they didn't so, have any rules back then where you could just run as many I times as you wanted. I, not yet, I don't think. <laughs> okay. But he so he lost, and every time like something big like that. Um, happened in his life. He just like went and did something really hard. Like he went to like the Badlands and Montana and mm -hmm. went on this super long hunting trip and all like Africa and all this shit. So, but he went to um, South America this time, and so he has like his one uh, uh, one son is down in South America with him. So he joins them. So they have like a huge like group of people. Mm. So they have to they get down there, but then they have to get to the actual like 
head of the river to actually begin the journey. Mm. And so along, I'm like, this is where I am right now. They're like just trying to get to the river. So like, there's not like fucking roads. It's like, like native people and mm-hmm. everything. And they keep lo- like all these ox are, are fucking dying. They have to like drop people um, from their crew because they're not going to have enough resources pretty much. They have to like turn around and all this stuff. And like, cause the way the book opens, it's like, he's like literally about to die. Like he has like malaria and all this shit. So it's like, I don't know. It's very, Imagine it's really cause like nothing had been touched. So the wildlife in the situation was probably insane back then. Cause when was Teddy Roosevelt? Was that early, early 1900s? Yeah. 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 So the Amazon was fucking crazy back yeah. then. Well, I mean, when he, when he was a kid, he had asthma yeah. and like his dad was a G um, yeah. before it, he died or whatever, but he pretty much got him into like getting healthy and lifting weights. Like he mm. got him a fucking weight room. Mm. No shit. Um, yeah. And then it was all on him and he bu- basically like beat asthma. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm. And then like overcame that and then just became like a outdoorsman fucking G. So I need to learn more sick. about fucking yeah. Teddy Roosevelt, I guess. Yeah. What about you, Trey? Personal development right now? Nothing. Nothing. Yeah. <laughs> just Twitter. Yeah. See, that's a grind, though. I think you got to separate, like, when you need development, when you just need to put in work. True. Yeah. Nothing. Yeah. yeah. You, uh, you've you been heavy in it in the past, though, but right now you just haven't had been yeah, interested in anything. I, yeah, I don't listen to I don't listen to any podcasts, not reading any books. That's the first time in a while you've been like that? I've been like this for, like, probably, like, half a year now. Yeah. 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 Ever since King Trey, <laughs> Twitter Twitter game emerged. <laughs> <laughs> I, go, I I'm like that sometimes. Like sometimes yeah. it goes in waves and stuff like that. But I like Danny. I usually like to double fish shit. Sometimes triple fish shit. Um, I like to break it out where here these headphones are driving me nuts. <laughs> where uh, the like is it your neck? Are you gonna lose it? <laughs> no, no he's fucking fuck 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 <laughs> <laughs> Um, basically, I like to have it in like three sectors. I like to make yeah. sure I'm listening to something that's like business related mm-hmm. or reading. Um, some business related, uh, some career wise, something leadership wise, mm-hmm. and then something like in the creative like zone. So recently, I've been reading the millionaire like real estate investor, Hell which yeah. has some pretty good shit. Um definitely one of the most like robust personal development things because it's got some like carnegie Mm -hmm. how to like raise your own salary type stuff in there sure it's got some actual tangible like real estate like what you should look for when you buy that and just like the mindset like one thing that i talked to you about was Mm -hmm. like there's a section of like the four stages of like becoming a millionaire which is like you have to like think you have to envision yourself being a millionaire then you have to buy a million so you're just working enough to buy up enough assets to, be to where it. it's a million dollars then you gotta um own a million which basically means those assets you you just bought whether you lease them or whatever they're paid off in full to where, to where now you're in the next stage of receiving a million which means those assets are now bringing you in another million yep so it's just like a huge snowball That's effect, a good, which i really yeah. fuck with that when you said that to me it really made sense of the path of the shit i've had to do it's like you know, you had to own the building for it to be worth a million. Then you end up paying it off. And then yeah. it's, then it, that, then the money it's creating we'll turns into you another million. I mean, yeah. it all, it all makes sense. And it all takes a long yeah. time. The other thing is people think when you're a millionaire, you have just a million dollars sitting around. And I'm sure there's some people that yeah. do, but usually it's the wide net worth of all your assets. A lot of people don't yeah. really, I never understood that. There was a whole, like, cause the, you know, you hear a lot of people saying like, I, you, you gain so much in real estate and shit like that, but it breaks it down to where like you get one property, you know, you mortgage that out over time, you're paying down the fucking loan to where the principal, like the equity is higher. Mm-hmm. Then eventually you rent that out. Then you get another one. Now you got double equity and it just keeps like snowballing. And shit Cause like you can like use that equity to the next hundred yeah. percent. Then at mm-hmm. like it said, it said like one of the goals was to get at the median house look price and always try to buy at 20, <coughs> 20% below, yep. like try to get a deal to where the opportunity is there automatically. Yeah, you're then, walking into equity. Yeah. You're walking into it and then taking that equity again just snowballing on top of it well think about that in theory if you buy it at 20 percent, you're walking into equity yeah. you're in it for two or three years and it goes up 20 percent. now yeah. you've increased your equity 40 percent of you know tangible exactly i mean it's and then at some point you, know, you have enough equity build up to where you can get like a duplex or some mm-hmm. shit like that then just continue to snowball so i fuck with that well it's, my whole thing was i like the businesses i'm doing so i'm gonna keep doing them and it's like if i'm paying down buildings or where i'm living or whatever and because I understand dividend investing now, whenever that day comes where I sell my crib, I sell this, whatever it is, I know exactly what I'm going to do. 
buy a bunch of fucking dividend stocks and click the fucking the numbers my way. And yep. you know, at a certain every million, if I'm buying stocks between two and six percent dividends, you just do easy math. Yeah, it also so. reminds me of Arnold too a little bit because in Total Recall he talks about like literally it's as simple as buying single family home yeah and then the duplex and the yeah. triplex and then the apartment building you know and then you're and own, then he's going you're owning half of easton I, yeah. I will say this is like probably this might be <laughs> really my half. new book of, <laughs> he owns a bunch of it i think Jesus. yeah <laughs> this might be the new book where if someone like i give this book to them to what's it called again the uh the millionaire real estate investor okay it's gary honestly keller. the first real estate book that i read that actually like fucking made makes sense, sense. <laughs> all right it actually Sick. makes sense gary that, keller Huh? Gary Keller. Right? I think so. Yeah, I from know. Keller Williams. Um, yeah. So yeah. We, that that side on the leadership side, Coach K just came out with the master class, mm. which, you know, I saw a master class like the ads and shit. I decided to pay for it because like, why not see what it's about? Because Scor uh, Scorsese has a fucking class so in there, ballin'. which is a G, but Coach K just came out with one. It's really good. Yeah. It's really good. Yeah. I think he's like, you either love or hate Coach K, I think, right? Because yeah. Duke won so much, eventually people start to hate him. It's like the Yankees, yeah. bro. Yeah, it's like the Yankees or the Patriots or whatever. Yeah. But I'm sure it's fucking, I'm sure there's got to be some nuggets in there. Yeah, there is. Yeah. Like his stories. And then, honestly, the Scorsese one was fucking good. Because that dude, honestly, like, in the creative space, there's not a lot of people I can kind of relate to. Most mm -hmm. creators are fucking wacky. They like to hold <laughs> themselves down to one thing or yeah. like they're waiting on someone else to tell them what to do. Scorsese's basically, he was Fuck a G. It. He was like trying to figure out shit on his own. Uh, whenever he was going to school, the people were telling him to do this. He's like, I ain't fucking doing that. So he did his own thing. So he's he's preaching a lot of like what we preach is like you got to figure out how the fuck you're gonna do it. Mm. Like the cameras and shit don't really matter if you if you had the vision and you you just know that you can execute no matter what. Yeah, who is so this? That was really good. Who is this? Huh? Martin Scorsese. Who's right? That? Who is who is it? Uh, he, he's the dude who did like Goodfellas and yeah, like all director. that shit. Oh, he's a got it. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, I read uh, Green Lights uh, or Green Light. Uh, Matthew McConaughey. It's really good. Really good. Did you read that too? I've read it. Yeah. And um, he journaled like his entire life, which is pretty wild. Yeah, and then went cool. back. I mean, like literally his entire life. He also would do things like that where he just disappear for like 10, 12 days at a time, you know, go on these sabbatical type things or whatever it's called. And what I got a lot from him was um, just like as he got older and he kind of shifted from doing this role to that role and like the way that he kind of moved his career and really, you know, and when the lights were on, he seemed to just have the answer. Like his first line, the one that from Days and Confused, that all right, all right, all right. All that shit is off the cuff. And that one line that wasn't even, it was something else. And he just threw that in it's there, <laughs> turned into yeah. a three week role. And he said, by that movie and the next movie, he couldn't even go to the grocery store. I mean, it was like, some mommies yeah 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 lots yeah. of mommies i think that and then uh <laughs> i just i like i liked i liked his whole vibe yeah then i would i would consider the true graphic gangster himself mr cartoon if you haven't watched the la original yeah, ne netflix Sick. documentary dude it's so fucking gangster yeah so basically which i watched this other like interview about him and basically his entire thing was is that he was in the drawing and he wanted to be just an illustrator he just wanted to paint and do shit like this and he was trying, like, he saw people painting on cars and shit, and he's like, oh, like, this this might be an avenue that I could eventually go into. Because I think he just wanted to make, like, big signs and, like, murals and shit like mm -hmm. that. But, which was, like, a good example of, like, sometimes the thing that you want to do, it will take you on another path, and this is, like, your entry point. Yeah. So he started painting signs and shit like that, or painting cars. And then he said he wanted to get into tattooing because he thought that th the art that he could illustrate... He like that would be a good way for him to just get it on people and people would know him yeah. and shit like that. So he said that he was going around to tattoo shops and shit like that, just asking to learn and no one would fucking take him. So he was like, well, fuck all you guys. I'm just going to like see if like, you know, my homies will fucking basically let me tattoo them, which they <laughs> which they ended up do, like doing. Yeah. And then that led him into I don't know how he got involved again on. But he was with like Cypress Hill and like all those guys traveling with them. Damn. And while they were on tour, he was tattooing like fucking motherfuckers in the backstage. So good. Like right before they'd go on show. So he's like tattooed like Eminem, like Snoop Dogg. Like he's big. Everybody, he's, yeah. he's known for that. And now he like runs his like own like creative like shit like that. But he was saying that like back then at the tattoo shops and shit like that, the customer service like role was close to zero. Yeah. Like they weren't like trying to help you. They weren't trying to do anything. They were expecting 
all this kind of shit. So he kind of like basically took all the business shit that he knew would differentiate him yeah. and like applied it. And Talk it about really keeping your cool. authenticity too. Yeah. Like that dude's like a 60 year old OG, bro. Dude, and he's fucking getting it too. He, <laughs> yeah. uh, David, he did a, like a tops like project, like I think it's called like project 50, right? Where they have all those designers come in oh, and yeah, do yeah, stuff yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, he made some like really fucking dope ones because he's got like the all like the LA style like fucking Hell yeah like gangsters type shit. It's pretty dope. What's yeah. it called again? The doc, LA Originals. So him and another dude, I, f- I forget it's his the camera name. guy. He's a camera yeah, guy. Yeah. He was like going up and he was documenting the entire the dude. Thing. He took a bunch of pictures of like Compton, he, a bunch yeah. of movies they were he's, running, like all kinds. He's of the shit, one. Bro. He's the one like uh, who took the famous like photo of the LA shit. Like yeah, that. he yeah, made like uh, that LA thing basically like pop. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Those guys are some f- fucking original gangsters for sure. So those dudes bro. are the original yeah. graphic gangsters. <laughs> I saw uh, this is off topic, but still inspiring because I was like looking at some stuff. Snoop was on a podcast uh, this last week talking about um, why Nipsey didn't want to play him in Straight Outta Compton said that uh dre cube and all them all hit up nipsey and he didn't even return her call and so they were like yo snoop like can you pull up like get nipsey to pull up and see like because he literally is the perfect person to play snoop Mm -hmm. and so you know snoop called him and he answered he's like y'all pull up whatever he said uh snoop pulled up and he was like he said he was excited to tell nipsey because he knew it'd be a big deal for him right it's a huge movie and he was like look man he's like they want you to play me like, I thought you'd be excited. And he was like, basically said like, hey, OG, like if I play you, they're never going to know me as Nipsey. They're only going to know me as the dude who played two or not Tupac, they played Snoop. He's like, and I got to be me. And Snoop is like, that's the most gangster of shit of all time. <laughs> <laughs> that's what he said. He goes, I think that's the most G gangster shit I ever, I think he ever did. Because yeah. think about it. Snoop won people. He's from South Central also. His entire life, people have probably compared him to Snoop because he got the same kind of yeah. vibe. He has Snoop having pull up when he's still like a subculture guy that a lot of people don't know. And he says no because he knows himself that because he believed in himself that much. Bro, I saw that clip today. It was inspiring as hell to me. Cool. That would be hard to do because you know motherfuckers are going to. But but if you're if you're labeled as that. Your own so, career's done. When you think about it, like, I think of Ice Cube's son, and now I don't know what he's done, but I automatically think, oh, he played his dad in uh, the fucking movie. It's hard to have your own I, I, Like, I identity. automatically think of that. Yeah. Well, I don't know what else he's doing. But. Yeah, so Nipsey would have been. And so, you know, obviously, maybe that would have taken away. But for him to, but the real one, Snoop's like, all right, I get it. You know, the skankster. But hey, he said he called Dre's, but fuck, find someone else. <laughs> hey, happening. So Have anyway. you watched that movie? No, I've never seen it. Oh, dude, that's a great movie. I saw the clip, though, on the um, the thing I was watching where uh, they had Snoop coming down, like, the hallway, and Dre was, like, doing a beat for nothing but a G thing on the keyboard. Dude, that movie's so good. <laughs> yeah. I think the, the one, there's one scene where uh, Suge Knight's in there and Ice Cube, this is whenever Ice Cube was, like, going through all this shit, goes in there and beats the fuck out of the entire, like, office. I don't know if that actually happened, yeah. but it was some good shit. That's yeah, a those great guys movie were running shit different back That's then. That's a great movie. To watch. I just remember because I was like, yeah, in high school or just right into high school, and they dropped none but a G thing, and you saw Snoop like walk through. I think it was like a parking garage or some shit, and yeah. he just started laying that down. I was like, what you know, is hey, this West Coast <laughs> shit? I'm not aware of. You know, uh, <laughs> you know, Wu Tang's got a show on Hulu. Uh, I watched, I've watched something on there before, but I don't know. It's, if a, I'm, it's an actual like show. Okay, like they produce the show. I need to check it like, out. Like, uh, it's really fucking good. It's called Wu Tang, like the American Saga. Uh, all about them coming up and shit like that it's oh really yeah good. Dustin mentioned that it's really good alright well hopefully you guys are inspired by the round table today <laughs> I mean I thought it was fucking good kind of went everywhere yeah yeah it was awesome yeah. alright I'm your boy Corey G small arms Danny at Trey Speed and the graphic gangster himself Cole Susak uh, shout out Max Ever Muscle uh, Extreme Pre and Sam Adams we are out